off and just like that we're back 2024 i am starting this year very different than i started last year i'm starting this year with no man no agents but i am starting this year with shows yeah girl is back on the road they tried to hold me down i'm back up in this bitch no weapon formed against me 2024 is going to be a doozy which was why I felt it was so imperative that I get back in front of y'all in a physical live sense. First stop, Chicago, January 19th and 20th at the Den Theater. And yes, I'm in actual Chicago this time. I ain't out there in Schaumburg. So I'll be doing stand up. You need the jokes. Who would have thunk that I'd need anti-Zionist material, but it is available. I told you 2024 is starting off different. I'll also be doing these political forums called In Amanda We Trust Live, where you're gonna get information, comedy, community. We'll do trivia that teaches us. We will get knowledge that empowers us because maybe we don't know enough and we need to teach each other. So get your tickets. If you love me, if you love me, buy them at amandaseals.com. Chicago's up first in two weeks. Coming up, we'll have Dallas, we'll have Toronto, we'll have Stanford, Connecticut, and more. Sign up for my newsletter so that you're not left out. Y'all, we're going to need each other this year. Mm -hmm. Get your tickets at amandaseals.com. Thank you. Shukran. Gracias. We need to be global this year, y'all. All right, y'all. You know what time it is. It's the end of the year. I got a hat on inside. All right? That lets you know that I'm on one. Because we traveling like Carmen San Diego to a new dimension. But before we head to that new dimension, we got to decide what we're going to keep with us and what we going to dump, all right? It is another edition of Keep It or Dump It, the 2023 edition here at Small Doses Podcast. Mm -hmm. Small Doses, self-help from the hip. Small Doses, we're talking that shit. Small Doses, and keeping it real. Small Doses, with me and Nancy Seals. It's so funky. So funky. <laughs> now, this is your first keep it or dump it episode, then you should know we do this every year where we talk about the things that have taken place over the course of the year. And some of those things we want to take with us into the next year. We're going to keep candy corn. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're keeping candy corn, just so we're clear. Y'all keep trying to dump it every year, but we're keeping that. Moni back here saying it's nasty. You know what, Moni? The only thing that's nasty is Miss Jackson. Okay. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time in Small Doses Podcast, Keep It or Dump It, what we're trying to do here is just keep our minds on the right track and, you know, cleanse, cleanse any of the things that have come up over the last year that we feel like are just not going to help us as we continue to move forward in this, this experience that we're having, this human experience that we're having. All right. Now, if you're following me on Instagrams or if you follow the Patreon, you already know things that I'm very passionate about. And those things will make it into here um, over a myriad of things. But I just want us to take this episode to do a collective look back at the last 365 to see how we're going to keep it or dump it through the next 365. Hit it. Before we get officially into the episode, I just want to point out that I want to dump the concept of the cat lady. Okay, because look, look at this. Look at this cat. She's making biscuits in the air. Okay, <laughs> oh my God, Jedi. Like, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't have the allergies, being a cat lady is a great experience that brings you so much joy, love, and cuddles. And I don't know that that can be really replicated by an actual human being. So I think we need to stop stigmatizing cat ladies for 2024. I mean, I have four cats and a dog because of it. Okay. So it made me a cat lady by actually bringing in the cats and then leaving. You understand me? So that cat lady business, we owning it. Aren't we? Aren't we jetties? Yay. Meow. All right. You like my outfit? It looks like I'm about to sing a Solange song. I tried to drink it away. Okay, keep it or dump it. Let's start with keep it. We're going to keep organized labor and strikes. What we have seen this year has been an unprecedented amount of labor unions and labor forces basically just saying, nah, nah. And doing so 
with real collective bargaining, really out here taking it to the streets. I was a part of a strike with the SAG after strike. We saw the WGA strike. You know, today, as we're recording this, Starbucks is like doing their own little strike situation. Uh, we saw the United Auto Workers striking. Uh, UPS had threatened to strike. The American Airlines folks threatened to strike. Uh, the American Airlines flight attendants threatening to strike. Um, I mean, I think I'm, of course, leaving people out. But the main thing is that we're seeing many of the American labor force say we are done being your minions and we need to get what we are deserving. Now, of course, we are watching inflation go through the roof this year and there's nothing that's getting inflated about salaries, right? Like people are still getting very low minimum wage. I mean, some states are gaining, are raising minimum wage, but sometimes it's only in particular fields, right? It'll be like, oh, we're raising the minimum wage for fast food. It's like, how about we just minimum, raise the minimum wage in general? And so what we're seeing is that so many of Americans are waking up and saying, OK, hold up. It's not even just that we're not OK with how you are dealing with us as, as like laborers, but like literally we cannot live. The rent is going up crazy. Gas is through the roof. But nobody's salaries are improving except for executives and at these people at these corporate levels doing God knows what. I mean, I remember the video that we saw a few months ago um, or maybe it was earlier this year. But this woman was basically saying, like, if you want to raise, you need to work harder. And she had just been given a raise as like the CEO of her company for doing nothing other than telling them you need to work harder. And she was not even the owner of the company, though, like she was just put in place. But I think what you have to understand, too, is what it means to be in labor, like in, in the labor force. And in America, what that so often means is just that you are just a you're part of a utilitarian system of capitalist gain. You're just a person being used to push something across the finish line. And that's why there is something to be concerned about with AI and the effort to bring in robots to take over Americans' jobs and humans' jobs so that it's like we don't even have to deal with your humanity. We don't have to deal with your health. We don't have to deal with your maternity leave. We don't got to deal with your uh, your grief counseling, et cetera, et cetera. Like, a lot of these companies would love to not have to deal with that. The reality, though, is that if that is the case, where do the people who actually exist here, like the human beings, where do they then earn? You know, and there is a genuine fear that so many jobs are going to continue to get pulled away from the actual work sector by things that don't require human elements. I mean, I was somewhere recently and I saw like a, a, a robot machine cleaning the bathroom. And I was like, I mean, that wouldn't work in the club because in the club, like the bathroom, the bathroom lady is important. She's there with the mints. She's got the colognes and the perfumes as well. She's got the gum. Y'all didn't go to the club. In New York, that was very important. The bathroom attendant at the club in New York was very important. And, like, if somebody got roofied, she going to find out. She going to know before anybody. Okay? Listen. So there's jobs like this that we may think are not that important. But, like, you can't, you can't replace the candy lady in the hood. Can't replace her with an AI robot. No, no, no. But I want to see these labor unions continue to grow. Um, in, in real ways. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes labor unions for people are frustrating because they're like, I'm paying all these dues and y'all aren't really doing anything. You know, you aren't really supporting us. But that's why we have to continue to always challenge any hierarchical structure with with what it is doing for the people that support it. So we are going to keep labor unions and the efforts that they use to get what they deserve. Strikes, protests and more. Dump it! <laughs> Honey, we got to dump these toxic celebrity relationships, which end up just being a mirror of everybody's toxic relationships. Oh, the toxic relationship, child. You know, I um, I had somebody send me a message today on my Instagram, and I'm going to tell you what she said. And it was very real, child. It was very real. She said, there is no emotional maturity in male culture. And more and more, women are done raising grown men. They are children among us. P.S. Thanks for your work, Free Palestine. I know so many folks don't want to hear that. But I wish that so many people who did hear that saw that as a challenge to not be that. Versus as a you're trying to tear down men. Now, I know that there are men who do see that as a challenge to say, you know what? I don't want to be that. 
I don't like that that's a perception of me, so I'm going to step it up. And the reason why I'm specifically speaking to men is because that's who I date. And in the relationships that I have been seeing, particularly in the celebrity toxic relationships that we see, the dynamic is men and women. And ultimately, there's just so many cases of the toxicity at its core coming from insecurity and lack of maturity. You know, you look at the blue face Krishan situation of things and you're like, first of all, why do we even know these people? You know what I'm saying? Like, I know I know them against my own will. But I also feel like so much of that has just literally been the dynamics of immaturity, lack of accountability, lack of responsibility, just toppling over into the the accessibility to be toxic, right? Like, because I don't need you, I can actually abuse you. Like, that's a thing. That's a thing. And I mean, in my own relationship, it was like, I started to realize like, oh, this is never going to change because the other person doesn't feel the need to change. Like, I will absolutely say that I have toxic things that I brought into that relationship that I wanted to actively remove from myself because I was like, I don't want this kind of exchange anymore. I need to acknowledge my own flaws. I need to acknowledge what I'm bringing to the table and let's do it together. Let's do it together. But over time, I realized that I was the only one doing it and he wasn't connected. He wasn't committed to it. And so many, I feel like men are committed to just like not just toxic masculinity, but the idea that in challenging their own toxicity, they are somehow emasculating themselves. And they, and doing that in the and, and doing that within the framework of a relationship is somehow you being controlled by a woman. Versus you saying, whether I'm with her or not, I don't want to be toxic. I don't want to be, you know, this type of of, of difficult. Um, I don't. I don't want to have this much difficulty in accessing joy. We also may have to dump the word toxic because we just keep using it so much in times that it doesn't add, that it doesn't apply. And we can also add narcissist and um, mental and 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 my mental health. These words. We need to dump using them so flipping gratuitously, and I'll add anti-Semitism to that one too. The way that these words are just thrown about so willy-nilly, it's it, they lose their actual potency for when they really are applied. But when we look at relationships like what we're seeing with Cassie and Puff Daddy, what we're seeing with Kiki and her her baby daddy Darius, you know what we what we heard with Britney Spears and Justin. Even the dynamic between Will Smith and Jada Pinkett. I think that the fact that they are celebrities puts their stories on front street. But so many of us can watch these stories and say, ooh, that kind of feels like something I've experienced or something I am experiencing. And so when I say we're going to dump toxic relationships in 2023, that means what we need to keep doing is pursuing our own individual wellness because that allows us to show up in our best selves to actually give love and not just seek to try and receive it. Because that's what makes you an energy vampire. And we keep sucking the life out of each other. Keep it! We're going to keep Black Athlete Redemption songs. Let's run it down. Shikari Richardson. Folks was like, she's done. She smoked the weed. She was out here acting a fool. Sis came back and said, bam, gotcha. Okay. And not only did she win, like in terms of like her actual race, but she won in terms of just like her, her consciousness around what this actual like, uh, what I want to say. She won just also with her consciousness of like the peanut gallery and its true value. You know, she won with her consciousness in herself, her self-love, like her ability to make choices that are best serving her and focusing on her winning and focusing on her race. Like literally it, it was that that focus on your own race thing. Like we say that as like a euphemism, but I, I mean, she applied it and she gets that that score of approval. Okay, prime time, Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders went over to Jackson State it didn't work out. He went to Colorado. Folks was like, why are you going to Colorado? This don't make no sense. Then he had like a toe or two cut off. Folks was like, I don't know how it's going to work. And then the man went over there to Colorado and really changed the game for NCAA football. 
I mean, ultimately, nobody was ever watching Colorado win a game or play a game. But he went in there and he brought black athletes into that space who ultimately may have not even been considered at that level of football. And he challenged those people who were outwardly racist, by the way. We must admit that these football games, woo, chat. They was not even hiding it. I was like, y'all wearing clan, like, are, are they selling clan hoods at the merch table? Like, what is this? But that was a redemption song to me in so many ways. This is also a brother who's been in football, been in the game for so many years. Like, we all know primetime. I mean, Willie Beeman in Any Given Sunday is based on him. And so to see him continue to move forward and also be able to create opportunities for his players, for his sons, et cetera, we love to see it. You know what else we love to see? Coco freaking Goff go off. That's what we'd love to see. Coco Goff went off at the U.S. Open. Okay? Now, in two ways. Now, in one way, she went off by literally just winning the whole thing. Okay? She won the jaw, She ran it. And that was major. But she also went off when she was playing that one chick who was trying to play with her mind and was trying to slow the clock and do all this BS. And she said, you know what? <sighs> I'm going to let it ride. I'm going to let it ride. And then she was like, nah. She went to the chair ump and was like, nah, this ain't cool. Why is she sitting down? The rules are you're not supposed to sit down. And people were trying to say that she was being finicky or she was being funny style. No. What she was doing was standing up for herself. And she has every right to do that. And they were trying to play her, just for the record. Okay? They were trying to play her. And I love that after when she won, she was like... Um, I mean, first they asked her, how do you feel about the match? And she was like, I mean, it was slow. Ah! Then when she won the whole shebang, they asked her, so, you know, who do you want to thank? She was like, I want to thank all of y'all who thought I couldn't do it. She definitely got up there and, 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 and <laughs> she definitely got up there and forehanded in y'all faces. Bah! Backhand. Ah! Slice. Ah! Who do y'all think I am? I'm Coco. So we love to see it. Redemption song. Okay? But we know the number one redemption song of this year with the black athletes. No, I'm not talking about the brothers of the U.S. gymnastics team who went to the World Gymnastics Championships and won medals that have never been won or that haven't been won in a long time. I'm not talking about them. I'm not even talking about the fact that there was four sisters on the World Championship gymnastics team. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about the fact that Simone Biles came back and Molly whopped the field, okay? I think she won by, like, over a point. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that this year, the top three spots in the world championships, I have chills, at the U.S. Gymnastics, was all sisters! Simone Biles. Okay, Rebecca Andrade of Brasil, okay? And then Shailene Jones of the USA, okay? And it wasn't just that they were three sisters. It was that they knew it. I'm getting emotional. They knew it. They knew what that meant. They knew how powerful that was. And if you've been in gymnastics, you've been following gymnastics, then you know that there have been so many times where it's just one black girl in the field. You saw that story earlier this year in Ireland where this little one black girl was at this competition and this lady gave medals to every single little white girl and then skipped over to black girl and then kept going with the white girls and then they offered this apology. Yeah, that's real. That's very, very real. So to see that the top three gymnasts in the world are sisters, last year in the United States, it was the top three in the United States. And it was already a big deal then. But I loved how proud they were of this. I loved watching them laugh. I loved watching them enjoy themselves in competition. You have to remember that Simone Biles is a, is a sexual assault survivor. Okay? You have to remember that when Simone Biles was at the Olympics in 2021, she was there because she was like, I felt like I needed to stay in the sport because there needed to be another survivor in the sport who could challenge this Larry Nasser man because the FBI had really not paid attention to these young girls. And when we see these gymnasts that were competing in the 2012 Olympics, 2016 Olympics, I mean, sorry, in the, in the 2012 Olympics, 2018 Olympics, Michaela Maroney, all these girls that are doing these incredible feats, they are being sexually assaulted on the regular and still coming out here and being able to do this. In hindsight, I just, I'm like, my mind is blown. 
So, you know, when Simone went through that in 2021 and she had to leave the Olympics, you know, the floor and she was like, you know, I just I can't do it. I, my, my brain and my mind are not there. She took so many L's. Everybody was like, oh, she's a quitter. Not everybody, but you know who I'm talking about. She's a quitter. You know, she, she doesn't support her team. She's not a true American. She's not a true patriot. So to see her be able to get her life on track on her own terms, she got married you know, she she took her time. She went on a tour, et cetera, and then come back at the highest level of competition and still be the highest level of competition was really just a beautiful thing to see. And to see her leading these other sisters again, it is a keep it for me. Dump it. <laughs> so let's get into Zionism. So I think a lot of us may have heard the term before, but didn't really know like the true depth of things until we saw the it, the series of events that took place after October 7th in Gaza, Palestine. Um, because, and I, the reason I put it in that way is because I think a lot of people were horrified by what they heard about the Hamas attacks on October 7th. A lot of that has been debunked since that since that point. However, at the time, there were a lot of mistruths and really um, just dramatic language being used to to support the Zionist effort to invade and to literally pummel the citizens, the Palestinian citizens of Gaza. And in that, a lot of people came to to start researching. Well, what really is Zionism? And ultimately, Zionism is a political ideology that parasitically attaches itself to Judaism as a way to force the um, existence of an ethnic state of Israel in what was known as Palestine, which was previously a part of the Ottoman Empire. And... There's a lot of history here to, to learn and to understand in terms of Zionism as a concept, how it was created, like who was a part of advancing it forward, how it then became the, the undergirding of the violent attack of Palestinians in 1948 in the Nechba, how it reaches us all the way to here in 2023. But for the many people, what we're understanding is that when we are attacking or we are addressing or we are challenging that, that Zionism, we are not being anti-Semitic. And for Ever it feels like that has been the way that has been the effort and that has been the very effective weaponizing of something that is real. Anti-Semitism is real, but weaponizing it over here to silence any detractors of Zionism. And what we understand now by what's happening is so many people are simply just getting the knowledge and information to be able to boldly stand on like, nah, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm saying I don't like this thing. Zionism, the conceptualization of this idea that this land is 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 owed to some people because of God or this land is owed to some people because these white people said that they could have it is really dangerous. Because ultimately it says that colonial that what well, ultimately it says that settler colonialism is fine. Especially when it's being done against Arab people in um Palestine. Now, then when you go even further down the rabbit hole, you learn about Zionism as it relates to Christian Zionism. And Christian Zionism is a whole other beast that is very frightening and also anti-Semitic, but works in tandem with Zionism. Because ultimately, Zionism as, for, for Zionism as it relates to Israel says, we want our own state with our own people. And they're calling it a democracy, but the only people that have the rights are Jewish people. And... They're saying we want as many people to come here as possible because that's what strengthens our state. Christian Zionists have a belief that when a certain amount of Jewish people collect and gather in this particular part of the world, that it will trigger the apocalypse, that it will it will actually be the catalyst for the return of Christ. And that when that happens, all those Jewish people will die and that will become the capital of the world for Christians. Do you hear what I'm saying? So you have one group over here that's like, yeah, like we are Jewish and we're Zionists and this is our space and this is our land. And the more of us that can be here, the more strengthens we are. 
And then you have Christian Zionists that are like, yeah, keep going over there. That's what we want. We want to see as many of y'all over there as possible so that y'all can all die. Like that's, the, that's what's happening. And then in the middle of all of this, you have America. You have America. By the way, there's like 10 million Christian Zionists worldwide. And there's like more Christian Zionists in America than there are even Jewish people in America. But the idea of Zionism is something that a lot of us are now getting acquainted with. And I want to dump it so bad in 2023. However, our country is so embedded with Zionism, both Christian Zionism and as it relates to Israel. So if what we're going to have to do is we're going to dump the idea that challenging Zionism is wrong. But we're going to keep on learning more because we know that if it's going to be this level now, it's much deeper than we can even imagine. And we got to get to the root to uproot it. Keep it! Okay, so I don't know about y'all, but social media for a long time has felt like, oh my God, get me out of here. Like, like I really, like two years ago, remember being like, my goal is to get off Instagram. Like, please let me get off Instagram so I can live my full life. Like, please, like, give us free. Give us free. And that shifted after October 7th because I have never seen social media so utilized for the raising of collective consciousness and education and support. Um, you know, I, I see people say like, why aren't you talking about Sudan? Why aren't you talking about what's going on in the Congo, et cetera? And we understand that part of the reason, much of the reason why those stories have been so silenced is because the people don't have the same access to phones. They don't have the same access to Wi-Fi, and they don't have the same access to English, which as a universal language allows for there to be a lot more understanding of things that are happening. Now, Palestine has been under siege for 75 years, and only this time are their stories actually being heard and lifted and supported in this kind of numbers. And much of that is simply because of social media, which is why we see efforts being made by the Biden administration to have more control over social media, right? Which is why we're continuing to see like silencing of like TikTok and, and these different apps. I mean, We've seen them censoring creatives who are talking against Zionism on these apps. I really have to tell you, I was shocked to see how many people began following me simply by my just speaking ardently and, in, and, in, and intellectually about the occupation and genocide of Palestine. Um, I have learned so much from just people sharing. Um, I have felt so much from just people's kindness. And I have experienced so much from just being able to see other perspectives due to social media. And I think so many people have done the same, which is why so many people are in the streets. So many people are boycotting. So many people are calling and, and haranguing their senators and their congresspeople. And it can't stop. Like, this has to be the breach. Like, we got to keep this because we need to continue to let this be the ways in which we are connected. When people ask me, like, what do you think is different about this time in history than the past? More, than, uh, more often than not, I'm just like, the Wi-Fi. I mean, imagine if, if Martin and Malcolm had been able to connect to each other when they weren't in the same place, you know what I'm saying? Beyond just telephones, right? Imagine if they were able to see what each other was doing and sharing in, in a more real-time way. Imagine if there was just much greater interaction with each other around the Vietnam War between the people that were actually experiencing it in Vietnam and here in America, and thus being able to see those horrors. There were people already against the war, but imagine, that's what we're experiencing now. This is a shift, and I truly, truly believe, I truly believe, that if we continue on this journey and we continue elevating as a group and connecting as a group in a way that we never have before, that we really can change the vibration and that we really can shift the axis of evil. 
But it's not going to happen just overnight. And it's going to happen by literal commitment and diligence to like, I am going to stay in this. That's why you see so many people who were like, yo, why aren't y'all posting about Palestine? Why aren't y'all posting about this on your pages? Why are you letting the fear continue to stop you, et cetera, et cetera? Because we know, we know what it's going to take is people being like, out, is go, people going outside of their norm. That's what all of us are being challenged to do. And so I want to keep, social media being a positive tool for doing that. Because up until this point, I really was like, I guess this is just for OnlyFans and that one chick on TikTok who makes a lot of money by saying, I see, I see, lick, lick. Oh, and tutorials. But actually, before I even move on from that, in the effort to boycott, which is what is going to have to happen, okay? Like, no more, like, the only thing that changes anything at this point is money and violence. And no one wants to see the violence. Well, maybe not yet. So the next step is to boycott. And when we ask, like, has that really worked in the past? Yes. Absolutely, it has worked in the past. But we are so lazy. I have committed myself. Who, child? I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Because I have my own addictions. But, like, I cannot buy more clothes for the rest of the year. Like, just as an effort. I know. Moni just looked at her watch. Moni. And it brings me so much joy. Like, literally, like, shopping brings me joy. It was something I couldn't afford to do for, like, a really, 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 really long time. So now that I can, it brings me joy. However, if I want to be a part of the global community that is utilizing the suppression of my profits and resources in order to push the ending of oppression then I have to be committed to that. And I have to really like challenge myself. And that's what all of this ends up being. Are you willing to challenge yourself for something different? Because drastic change requires drastic change. <laughs> now, on the dump it side of things, I know it feels like I'm yelling at you. Sometimes I feel like I'm yelling at myself. And I do feel like we do need to do a lot of addressing of how we can be better at talking to ourselves to improve ourselves, right? Like, I like to think that I am being better at just coaching myself versus like admonishing myself. Because abusive self-talk, it doesn't, it's not a reflection of like you necessarily like being tough on, that's not tough love for yourself. You can still get the point across to yourself, you know, in a way that doesn't have to feel like trauma. And if you're like me, you know that the way that you talk to yourself ends up being the way that you talk to people. So the 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 reality is, is that if you really, really want to change all of the above, you're going to have to start with you. Most of all of this starts with you. But then there's also like learning the difference between like people pleasing and just exercising common courtesy. And I know that sometimes I find myself using that uh, abusive self-talk, self-speak, uh, abusive self-speak, when I feel like I have not shown up as the courteous, considerate person that I want to be and that I want people to be with me. And people-pleasing can be the result of that, right? Where you're just like, I want, I don't want people to think that I'm not this thing. So I'm going to just go above and beyond but you get drained and people will drain you when they learn that about you. Not all, but some. And boundaries are a real thing. And so many of us don't exercise boundaries that we really feel like we, we need because we don't want to disappoint people. We don't want people to feel like they don't like us. When the truth is, is that if you express your boundaries and they're reasonable, who, who, who is anyone else to say that they don't like your boundaries? For instance, I just, as a rule, don't take pictures when I am not at a work event. It's very rare. I mean, there may be a unique scenario, but for the most part, like if I go to a concert and I'm there at the concert to like enjoy myself, I'm not going to be taking pictures with folks because that's not, it's not even my night. You know what I'm saying? Like it's the, it's whoever's concert we went to is their night. So I will really like say, you know, I'm off the clock. Thankfully, for the most part, my audience will be like, you know what? Okay, I respect that. But sometimes people really push you. 
And they're like, oh, you off the clock. Like, you can't just give one picture. And it's like, why are you pressing me right now? But it's taken me a while to be, like, really steadfast in saying, no, I'm off the clock. Even when people press me because I don't want them to carry forth, like, this negative example of me because I've had to deal with that for so long. People using abusive language to me. Oh, nobody likes you. You're difficult. You're extra. You're you're this, you're that, et cetera. And so I'm so afraid of that actually continuing to be the narrative that I would sometimes like go against my own boundary to people please. When ultimately, baby, they're going to say whatever they say regardless. <laughs> so you might as well stick with what works for you. And affirmations are something that I think all of us really could be like, doing on a daily basis. And I know that sometimes it feels like they're corny. Sometimes it feels like they're kind of redundant, but that's the idea. You know, they are redundant. The rep- the repetition is what brings you, you know, to the core, to the fore. So stick with it. My current affirmation is you are lovely. You are worthy. You are deserving. Okay. You are lovely, you are worthy, you are deserving. And sometimes that's what I need to say to myself when I want to actually criticize myself. Because if I come at myself with that type of love, then I will be far more encouraged to change than feeling like I need to do it from a place of fear. Let's keep it. African-American studies. Now, this year, we saw the continued onslaught of removing Black studies from curriculums, of removing Black books from schools, of removing DEI, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion programs. And we all know that what this is really about is that when people learn history, they gain empathy. And empathy is the actual most valuable resource for change. Yes, the money and the boycotts and the violence, all those things, they they may be the actions. But the drivers, the catalyst for change on a human level is empathy. And these people know that. You see, they saw it in 2020 when people took to the streets after seeing the murder of George Floyd in front of their faces. And they understood, oh, wait, this is this cannot stand. And so now we will go stand. And what we're seeing now in Palestine, in learning about the Congo and Sudan, is people are saying, hold up. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> and it's because of history. People are now able to, they're going back. And they're able to, by going back, see the plight of people and connect to them and relate to them. So when we see folks doing everything in their effort to shut down African-American history, it's really, in my opinion, just solely based on we do not want people to really understand the plight of Black people because then they're going to want to help them. (laughs) They're going to want to change the course of this nation and shift it from white supremacy. And white supremacy is not simply just an ideology. It is a power structure. I mean, honestly, what we're seeing in Palestine and Israel is the extension of white supremacy to another group. It's just that for so long, it's only really been extended over there. But now, and we see, but now in seeing the oppression and suppression of Palestinian voices, of pro-Palestinian supporters, of people who are anti-genocide, anti-Zionist, we're like, oh, this is white supremacy. That's what white supremacy does. White supremacy says, no, anything that is not supporting this is anti and we must suppress it. We must remove it. We must eradicate it. And African-American studies by nature of just its existence is that it is anti-white supremacy because what it does is it shows all of the horrors and it also describes all the ways that we've managed to survive and thrive in spite of it. And I... I commend everyone who's making it their business to find ways to interweave African-American studies into their children's, you know, um, lives and curriculums into their own lives. Right. All the artists who are making sure to put it into their work, 
Because what we have to do is we as a people, we got to take it out of the hands of the government that never wanted it in the first place and make sure that we keep it in our hearts and we keep it top of mind. So we got to always keep African-American studies. You know, I know I didn't really do that many smart, funny and black shows this year, but I understand my assignment. And I know that next year I have to come back. I know that I have to find a way to bring smart, funny and black to another level and to another audience as a tool that challenges them trying to dump African-American studies because we're trying to keep it. We're not even trying. We are keeping it. Always and forever. Let's take it to a dump it. <laughs> Can we dump just dating? <laughs> So as somebody who's back in the dating pool right now, I mean, honestly, like I have like told myself, like, you're going to take a three year break from men. You just need a full cleanse. Like, it's just you got to you just got to like let it go. Um, The problem is, have you ever had a good makeout session? You'd be like, oh, this is valuable to me. <laughs> but then it can never go past that, it seems, because. Ultimately, I feel like we are just, there's like no etiquette left in how we interact with each other romantically. There's like, it's like we're lacking like a shared practice of principle and morals, like of values. And I know that at one time we used to just call that chivalry or, you know, patriarchy. <laughs> but at this point, I'm just like, it seems like everyone no, let me not say everyone, but it seems like the vast majority of folks are dating without any intention. And when I say intention, I don't mean that they just aren't dating without the intention of being together with you, or et cetera. I mean, they're dating without the intention of regarding you as an individual worthy of consideration, right? So it's like, to me, being considerate of somebody is not leading them on, right? Being considerate of somebody is being clear about your intentions with them. But so many folks don't actually know what their intentions are. So they're just willy-nilly. They're not even just saying, I don't know what my intentions are. They will manifest some like fake element of things that sounds good in their minds, with, even though they have no intention of actually coming through with that. Or even though they have no set of tools to actually support that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you're like, yo, where did you get that from? Did you see that on a TV show? What even is this? But I think it's because not enough of us are doing the connections with ourselves. So we can't even properly connect with other people. I just wish that there was much more of an effort of just blatant transparency and honesty that saved everybody's time. Can you just save me some time? If you're like, listen, I'm really into you, but I just really don't have the bandwidth to like show up the way that I would feel like you deserve. Is this something you would like to do casually? I might say yes. I might. If you're like, listen, that was a great night. Um, you know, I'm glad we had that makeout session. Um, it was great seeing you. Um, be blessed. I'm probably going to say be blessed too. And that's something that we should be able to do. If you're like, listen, I am trying to really figure out like some things about myself right now. And so I'm just not able to be a present partner. Say it. But nobody, ugh, stop saying nobody, Amanda. You know, people don't like a generalization, but not enough of folks are really like clear on what they're actually doing to be able to even communicate it to somebody else. So my, the moral of the story is <laughs> good luck girls. I mean, honestly, I don't know. It's rough out here. All the folks out here who are dating, I would just ask you to really sit with yourself and meditate on what your actual intention and goal is in every single interaction, right? Like this person I'm talking to, this is where we are. Like continue to do check-ins with yourself so that you can show up in a genuine, authentic way in the space. Because the, the thing is, not all of us can Mariah Carey. I would love to be able to sue all you for wasting my time, but I can't. Shout out to Mimi. She's a legend among us all. As we come to the close of 2023 and we come to our last keep it, 
I said, what, what is a keep it that gathered us together? What is a keep it that brought us joy? What is a keep it that, that we will forever remember? And that, my friends, is August 5th, 2023. The day that a brother on a dock threw his hat in the air. And would rain down. And what came next was a barrage of blackness to challenge at the fade in the water. Now, y'all know that 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 situation in Alabama, that was real. That was crazy. OK, that was a beautiful time. That was a beautiful time. And what it said to us was that, you know, if we could collectively gather as black folks all the time, I feel like things would be very, very different. I think things would be very, very different. I mean, I just I just think about the way in which so many of us were so empowered and excited by literally just us showing up that this brother didn't have to be by himself and how ex- like enthusiastic folks were to get on out there and get in the mix. The brother was swimming. The brothers came off the boat with the shirts off already. And of course, we can never forget the folding chair of power, okay? This this was a momentous day. Moni over here was surprised I will remember it. I will always remember August 5th. And we should always remember August 5th. It is a keep it that we should celebrate every year. It's a secondary Juneteenth. Okay? There was a, there was a liberation that happened that day. And it's honestly interesting that earlier that day, there was a group of women who had come down to that very dock to do a spiritual ceremony atoning for the the, um, slaves that had been sold on that dock because it used to be an auction block for slavery. And so earlier that day, they had come down there and said words and cleansed it. And boom, those same ancestors came through the people. And now I own a pair of earrings and a necklace with a folding chair. Keep it. Montgomery, Alabama. Fade in the water. Fade in the water. Pew, pew. Fade in the water, children. Oh my God, that's swimming. Fade in the water. He got a chair. Trouble's gonna come up the water. Keep it. All right, let's get into a last dump it. Now, one thing we can keep this year is my documentary in Amanda We Trust and just the idea of creating things independently. Now, in the process of doing my documentary in Amanda We Trust, you know, I became to just learn so much more about the American government, the processes of it, et cetera. But by the end of the year, I must say that I'd become radicalized. Because I really thought that with enough effort, we could um, radically change the American government. But I think what I didn't understand is just how much we would have to change in order to radically change the American government. And ultimately, it feels like we would have to change it um, beyond its existence. And that really came about in realizing just how many senators and congresspeople have been paid by APAC, which is the Zionist lobby, and the laws that protect Israel from being challenged by Americans, the laws that are actually, like, supporting, I mean, sorry, the laws that actually, like, say that you can't boycott Israel. So that let me understand, like, oh, our government is in so deep in this and this is what we actually know. It's so it's in so deep with this that it's not it's not able to function democratically. It's literally unable to function democratically because it is serving another master. And ultimately in a democracy, the actual people are the masters of their fate. That's what's supposed to happen through governance. When I saw that in Ohio, the people voted to actually codify abortion rights. But the majority Republican um, House of Representatives in Ohio said no. 
we actually are going to continue to keep abortion rights illegal, regardless of the fact that the people voted to codify it. So when you start seeing this, this is what fascism is. Fascism is literally when the leadership has complete control over the laws and legislations of the people without any um, effect of the people. So we're dumping the American government. I am going to be taking an Amanda We Trust on the road because I originally wanted to do that to encourage people to vote. But ultimately, I want to do that to encourage people to learn. You know, one thing we got to keep every year is our tenacity and our desire and our curiosity to educate ourselves. I have never been this smart in my entire life, y'all. The amount of information that I have learned <laughs> in the last, like, four months, I'm out here, my brain is very large, and I'm using the tools that I've always had, right? Critical thinking, comparative analysis, comprehension, to take this new information and synthesize it with the old information, and you're like, oh, my God. It's like that gif and it's helping me to feel more grounded than I ever have before even though I know more than we ever have before about how it really is you see that's why people think ignorance is bliss because they think what they don't know can't hurt them but what we know is that what we don't know is hurting us you know we want to keep trying to get our student loans forgiven I mean now that there's billions of dollars to send to Israel, how is there not an ability to give us student loans? Now, some might say, well, you wasn't saying that about Ukraine. Ukraine was actually invaded by Russia. And I understand the dynamics of this situation and why America needs to protect Ukraine. In Israel, though, they are actively committing a genocide against Palestinians. And Americans are actively supporting this. And the thing about it is that Americans have been actively supporting Israel's universal health care, Israel's free education systems, Israel's defense mechanisms. So our American government felt like that was a more of a priority than making the George Floyd bill go through. And some might say, oh, my God, Amanda, you're conflating. You can't put the two in the same space. But I'm going to tell you why I can. Because I can promise you that there were reasons that have to do with one that prevented the advancing of the other. And it is very disenchanting and demoralizing to realize just how bought and sold our government is. So many people are saying they will not vote in the next election they don't want to vote for Joe Biden and they don't want to vote for Donald Trump. And they feel like it is a radical choice to not vote at all. I am here to tell you that it is not a radical choice. But I'm also here to say that we need to create another option that can actually possibly win. And that's never happened before because there haven't been there hasn't been a scenario where there were this many people so disenchanted by this lesser of two evil system that they are willing to connect to a third option in, in numbers. Is there a way that we can make this horrific nightmare into a miracle? I mean, one of the people running is Marianne Williamson. And what does she say? A miracle is a change in perspective. So the change in perspective to me around the American government is in the past, I thought we just need to get more involved and I think even though that is a part of it, because we're seeing that they're trying to make absolute concerted efforts to get out any of the progressives from office. It's not just about us getting more involved. It's about us getting more intentional. And finding strategy. And so many of us have been asleep for so long, but you're waking up. And I want to keep us awake in 2024. All right, so we're going to go to the Patreon where I'm going to talk about some of my personal keep it or dump it's because it's been a hell of a year for your girl, Amanda Seals. All right. And uh, yeah, buddy, we're going to get into some of mine. 
So head on over to the Seals Squad. That is Patreon Amanda Seals or the Amandaverse.com. And let's get dangerous. So dump it. People who do not show up for themselves, dump it. Because if you if they don't show up for themselves, they're not gonna show up for you. And you deserve it if you are showing up for you and showing up for them. And I think sometimes we don't, we're like, the ultimatums aren't a good thing. Sometimes they're the only thing. Sometimes that's really all there is. This is an ultimatum, and that ultimatum is going to define someone's character and how they feel about your relationship. And I'm never in here bored. There's always some exciting thing going on with the animals. Even when they're sleeping, it's exciting because sometimes I'm just like, oh, my God, they're sleeping next to each other. They're cuddling. Oh, my God, I love it. And I don't know if, the, if certain things will ever get remedied, but I know one thing's for sure. Your girl ain't here for no play. All right? Quit playing in my face. <laughs> we're dumping that for 2023. Now, before we go, we're going to do some rapid fire, keep it or dump it for 2023. All right? Hit it. Mischief Red Boots. These are them boots that look like you are in a video game. Dump it. Ozempic for weight loss. I can't even deal. Like, y'all were so extra about this that it literally made a shortage for diabetics. But I think it speaks more so to just, like, the fact that we do have a, a health issue and a weight issue here in America that is very hard to be helped because the food is so bad. So a lot of people are like, why can't I lose weight? And it's because literally everything we're consuming is harmful to our, our metabolism and our weight, et cetera. So I say all that to say, though, like, y'all, lay off the needle. Ticketmaster. Dump it! Ticketmaster, Live Nation, all the above. I mean, the Swifties was not here for y'all this year. I wasn't here for y'all last year. And I still haven't seen any changes since Pearl Jam and Eddie Vedder weren't here for y'all in the 90s. That's a lot of dump it. Love is blind. I just, I, you know what? I've watched two seasons and I've had to let it go. I've had to let it go. I mean, I don't even think the show even makes sense anymore. You know, they're going to need to go somewhere that's never seen the show before in order for it to actually be good again. And I don't know if that exists. So I'm going to dump it. Frequent Flyer Miles. You know, Delta tried to do something weird about Frequent Flyer Miles. And, you know, you, you work really hard to try and get like a certain status. And then they're like, yeah, F your status. But I will say that I have amassed quite a number of Frequent Flyer Miles. And it's allowed me to actually be able to take trips on like... A, 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 a small time. So if you're getting frequent flyer miles, try and get them through someone else's money. That's what you should do. I'm keeping it. Caring for Hawaii is a keep it 100%. Again, Hawaii is a American settler colonialist project. It was taken over. It was usurped. It was annexed. A lot of people don't know that history. A lot of people just think of Hawaii as like, oh, this is where I go for vacation. So when we see what happens in Maui and we don't know how it happened, we always have to remember the actual history of the presence of America there. You know, there were people that were literally like snorkeling the same day as the fires around Maui. I can't stand y'all. People in Hawaii are like, please do not come here for tourism. Respect that. There's other places to go. And I think it's also time for everybody to start getting like awareness around, well, what other places are American settler colonialist projects? Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. Okay. These are examples. So we're keeping caring for Hawaii because that also goes along with us just keeping caring for the fact that we have to change the trajectory of how this world has been made for the next phase of where it's going. Barbie movie, we're going to keep it. Barbie movie was a lot this year. It was giving you so much pink. Ta-da! Also, I've just been a Barbie fan forever, and I just thought it was really smart. It was really smart. It was really creative, and it's not something I would ever need to see again, um, but it was intentional in a way that I feel like a lot of films just aren't these days, and I didn't I know that it was like a massive film, which is kind of like the only movies we get to see now. It's basically like if it's not a huge feature, then it doesn't go out in the theaters. But even in its massiveness, it still had a very independent element feeling to it. And that's a, that's I can attest to Greta Gerwig as a director. So shout out to the Barbie movie. Now, hairstylists making people come pre-wash and blow it is going to be a dump it. Um, I think the reality is that 
a lot of us can't do our own hair, which is why we go to get our hair done. <laughs> so I do feel like there should be a conversation before, but I think that there's a lot of hairstylists now who can only do like one half of the hairstyle process and are not engaging in the first half of it. And then they want to charge you if you expect that, which I don't think should be the case. And I think that all these rules where it's like you get charged if you're late, but they don't get a disc they don't give you a discount if they're late, et cetera. Get it out of here. We got to realize that we are community. And if we don't start acting like community, we are going to get even divided and conquered more than we already are. So let's start with the braids <laughs> and the goddess locks. X and Twitter, we're going to dump it. I was already done with Twitter when Elon Musk took over. But then when he changed the name to X, I'm like, exit for me. I'm out. I'm out. And lastly, dump it. Can we dump them little baby hair things that y'all do to hang down on the forehead? Can we dump it? Can we let it go? What is that? It's like a baby hair bang. It's like to keep the lace front on, I don't, I guess, or to cover up. Whatever it is, I need it to exunt in 2024. Okay? I need it out of here. That's been another keep it or dump it, y'all. Drop your keep it's or dump it's in the comments. Let us know what you're leaving behind and what you're taking with you. And tell a friend. Because, baby, New Year, New Me is around the corner. And we got that picture with the chick walking up the stairs with the bag full of stuff. We're going to drop that bag down the stairs. No baggage in 2024. All healing. All love.